Voice of America presents The Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Good evening, this is Ronald Coleman. And Benita Coleman. Inviting you to join us again on the campus of Ivy College. Welcome again to Ivy, Ivy College, that is, in the town of Ivy, USA. For the past week, administrative chores have been delegated as much as possible because President William Townhunter Hall and his wife Victoria have been and are deeply involved with a benefit theatrical production for the undergraduate Ivy players, written, acted, and presented by the staff and known as the Faculty Follies. This is the first rehearsal day, and the halls are waiting for Sidney Mullins, manager of the student players, to arrive with a progress report. Dr. Hall is saying, And I find it very stimulating. Whether it is the variation from my usual routine or the excitement of a theatrical production, I don't know, but... I find myself thinking much too little of budgets, endowments, and curriculums, and much too much of costumes, scenery, and how does one do an altar buffalo? And by the way, what is an altar buffalo? <laughs> this, is sort of, this is sort of a sideways dance step that takes you off stage, darling, but you won't have to do it. Oh. After you finish your number, you just get up from the piano, acknowledge the thunderous applause, and walk off. Uh, yes, but suppose there is no applause, thunderous or otherwise. What do I do then? Blush and hide under the piano? Oh, you're much too modest, darling. I'm not worried about you being a success. What I'm worried about is Mr. Wellman. Mr. Wellman? Well, yes. He says he's going to keep us from putting the show on. How do you suppose he intends to do it? Oh, my love, I haven't the hardihood to follow a thought through the devious convolutions of the Wellman mind. The way is badly lighted. Damp with tears never shed, and pitted with the graves of kindly deeds struck down in their youth. <laughs> Maybe he intends to set the Board of Governors against us, and what will you do about that? Oh, I've already done it. I have polled the members separately and collectively. I sold each of them a block of tickets, thus putting them in the position of protecting an investment. <laughs> Toddy, you're wonderful. Oh, no, no, not really, darling. I'm just resourceful, ingenious, clever, alert, kind, <laughs> and shrew. <laughs> also available Saturday afternoons for babysitting, dog walking, and instruction on the mandolin. <laughs> No, my darling, my only trouble with the Board of Governors was keeping them from participating in the show. You mean his entertainers? I don't mean that, but they did. <laughs> I had no idea there was so much talent lying around loose. I use the word talent loosely. <laughs> and the word loose advisedly. <laughs> it seems that our governing board numbers among its members two zither players, one silhouette cutter, four baritones of the Nelson Eddy or give a man a horse he can ride type. <laughs> And one Latter-day Houdini who specializes in removing his vest without taking off his coat. No oh, yes. contortionists. Oh, they were all contortionists. What? Well, you, you should have seen them bending over backwards to be polite and bowing me out at the same time. Oh, yes. Sounds like quite a trick. And we mustn't forget that old juggler, Mr. Wellman, who keeps everybody up in the air at once. And I wish I knew what he was. Well, that must be our, our junior impresario, Sidney Mullins. Yeah, I'll let him in. Well, I hope he's lined up a better brand of talent among our professors. Hello, Sidney. Come right in. Hiya, Mrs. Hall. I hope you ate your crunchy wunchies this morning. You'll need your strength when you hear Professor Heaslip make a bum out of Shakespeare. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Hall. Hello, Sidney. I gather you think Professor Heaslip lacks a certain something as a Shakespearean actor. Oh, he's not too bad. Which is my first falsehood today. <laughs> well, Shakespeare was superstitious. He made it Twelfth Night because he was afraid Professor Heasley would play it on the 13th. <laughs> well, let's not be harsh. Except for you, Victoria. We are all amateurs. Well, except for Sidney here, too. He says when he was a little boy in the theater, he didn't have a chance to play baseball. So the Chinese acrobats used to toss him back and forth with their feet. <laughs> oh, it was a great childhood, believe me. 
I was 18 before I knew drop the handkerchief was a game. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was just something the pretty girl in the Spangles did before she climbed up on the trapeze. <laughs> well, y you want to hear how things are lined up, Dr. Hall? Oh, yes, I would indeed. They tell me the tickets are selling rapidly, that we have cornered all the available faculty talent, and the production seems to be well in hand. <laughs> You've just given me my own report, sir. The talent is solid. Except for ham slip. Uh, I mean, he slip. I suck. Well, I would suggest, Sidney, that we remember that the participants in this production are all volunteers, giving freely of their time and talents, and that we should accord them all the courtesy and consideration due them. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Hall. I, I almost forgot an old theater tradition. Never wrap a fellow performer except when necessary, and then try to remember why it is necessary. <laughs> now then, Mullins report. The meeting is called to order. Mullins to headquarters. The band is rehearsing like crazy. The sets are ready, and we got a good show laid out in routine. Professor Dillard of the chemistry department, magic act. Kent in mathematics, a chalk talk. Dr. Hall's secretary, Goodson, knife throwing, and... Knife throwing? <laughs> oh, good heavens, and, and to think of the times I've turned my back to her after correcting her punctuation. <laughs> throwing simplifies her work. I mean, she can pin up your speeches on the wall and cut 2,000 words out of them from across the room. <laughs> <laughs> well, what else, Sidney? Well, then we've got you, Dr. Hall, doing the three blind mice, a la Kipling, and Mrs. Hall singing Alice's House, and every ten minutes, some new talent jumps out from behind a blackboard. Only one hitch. No MC. Well, can't you master the ceremonies yourself, Sidney? Oh, yes, sir, I... But I, I think it would be better to keep it a faculty show. Well, how about you, Mrs. Hall? Well, I'm going to sing, Sidney. You better get somebody who's nothing else to do. Well, well, we'll work it out, said he, doubting it very much. Now then, most of the uh, professors have classes this afternoon, but we can go over to the auditorium now and run through your numbers, huh? My car is outside, if you don't mind walking the last part, because half a mile is asking a lot of it. <laughs> Cecil B. De Mullins, folks. <laughs> Let's have a little lull, kids. Now, now we want to run over a couple of numbers. I'm afraid mine will sound as though it had been. Had been what, dear? Uh, run over. <laughs> Nonsense. It's wonderful. Oh, Mrs. Hall, how's about trying your song now, huh? No, you're fine. I'm ready. Oh, good, good. Okay, everybody, quiet, please. We're going to run over Mrs. Hall's number, Alice's house. Hank, how about an introduction? And, and keep it bouncing okay, and bright. Okay, folks, okay. Break it up, break it up. <laughs> No more rehearsal. The show's off. Everybody go home. Why, Officer Grogan. What do you mean, no more rehearsal, Grogan? We just started. Mrs. Hall, far be it from a mere cop to dispute the president's wife, but you just finished. It's orders. You gotta break it up. Whose orders, Grogan? The fire commissioner. Of which? Uh, I mean, of whom? Which is it, Doc? Well, I... I think you mean whom. Of whom what? Of whom, what, Mr. Clarence Wells? <laughs> Chief Fire Commissioner. This building is held under violations 542, 756, 23, and 139 of Section B. Not enough exits, stage doors opening inward instead of outward, smoking on stage, untested extinguishers, and no fireman requested to stand by during rehearsals. I'm sorry, but I got my orders. Well, Grogan, you... An old vaudeville performer. I thought you loved the theater. I do, ma'am, and I also love to eat. To eat, I gotta wait. To wait, I gotta obey orders. I got orders to close up the show. So, QED, as the saying goes, Grogan follows orders. <laughs> but, Grogan, we, we can fill the extinguishers, we can change the doors, we can get a fireman to stand by, we, we can enforce the no-smoking ordinance on the stage. Yeah, and we can hang Mr. Wellman up by his thumbs. <laughs> Excuse me, folks. Yes, Sidney. Grogan, not of McGillicuddy and Grogan, old-time songs and new stolen jokes. The same kid, but the title was Grogan and McGillicuddy, just to correct you. Played, uh, well, we played the Gasson time. Uncle the... Francis! Uncle Francis. Don't you remember me? Huh? Little Sidney Mullins, the four flying Mullins, Roscoe, Mamie, Biggie, and Flip. And me, little Sidney, 
When I was only a year old, you used to sneak back to the dressing room and feed me. Barbecued pork and strawberry pop. Well, no wonder Vaudeville died. Well, Sidney Mullen. Yes. Well, well, it certainly is a small one. Hey, your old man owes me a buck for laundry. <laughs> Hibbing, Minnesota, it was. He told me, Uncle Francis, he told me if I ever saw you that I... Uh, here, here's the dollar. And say, remember the soft shoe you used to do? Uh, this one? Huh? Look, kid, look, look. It's no use playing on my sentiment. I get orders to close the show. I... You mean you remember that old number? Could anyone ever forget it? Hey, cut it out. Cut it out now. Look, I'm Grogan the cop. I got orders. Close the show. Yes, but Grogan, you, as an administrative officer on this campus, you are qualified to participate. Your talent, we need you. Oh, please, Uncle Francis. Oh, wait a minute. Hey, this Clarence Wellman now, uh, he couldn't be the Wellman of Wellman and Fish knows it had to train Sealac. <laughs> No, Grogan, I am sure this Mr. Wellman was never in show business. In fact, he obviously dislikes show business and show people. Oh, uh, he does, does he? Hey, Sidney. Uh, give me that lead in again. Right. Nothing could be finer than to be in Carolina in the morning. Nothing could be sweeter than to step right up and meet her in the morning. I was by your house last night. Why didn't you come in? I didn't know where you lived. No, 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 Uncle Francis, please. What's the matter? What's the matter? It's a soft shoe, Uncle Francis, a soft shoe. You can't do it in those shoes. Uh, yeah, I guess you're right. These is cop shoes. Uh, these shoes are good on the beat, but the beat ain't right for these shoes. <laughs> Well, I'll go right on home and get my old, old soft shoes on it. Don't nobody go away now and, and a bath till I get fired. Yeah, good. Oh, okay. Uh, how about it, Mrs. Hall? You ready to do your number? Always oh, ready, Sidney. Drop of a hat, Cromwell. They used to call me. Yes, we'd better get on with it before Mr. Wellman realizes we have captured his emissary and pays us a personal visit. Oh, right, Dr. Hall. Okay, boys, okay. Fiddles under chins, knuckles on the fret. Ready for Mrs. Hall's number. Now, let's have a little quiet among the loungers, please. And stagehands, lay off the poker playing a while. Ready, everybody? Oh, let's all go round to Alice's house. Cause Alice's house is like a palace is Alice's house. There's a carpet on the floor, a locker on the door. I never had so many people lock the door before. Free and easy, free and easy. And when you get in, it's ever so go as you please. So let's all go round to Alice's house. Cause Alice's house is like a palace in Alice's house. Hello? Oh, it's Alice. Well, what does she want today? Alice. Well, what does she have to say? She has a wonderful plan for us, a way to spend the day. She suggests we all go over to her house. Alice is. Yes. My Alice is. He's like a palace is. It is. Well, let's all go round to Alice's house. Cause Alice's house is like a palace is Alice's house is house. She says that Alice's house is like a palace is Alice's house is house. There's a carpet on the floor, a knocker on the door. I never heard so many people knocking on the door before. Right and easy, free and easy. And when you go in, it's ever so good when you please. So let's all go round to Alice's house. Cause Alice's house is like a palace. It's Alice's house. It's like a palace. It's Alice's house. It's like a palace. It's Alice's house. Mrs. Hall, in two words, Sam.
Sensational. Well, thank you, Sidney. It's been a long time since I've done that number. Oh, you were wonderful, my darling. <laughs> but you are always wonderful. And I am always saying so. Oh, Toddy, this is so much fun. And to think that Mr. Wellman should be trying to... Did I hear it. my name mentioned? Mr. Wellman. What's going on here? I mean, why is it going on here? Where's Officer Groger? Oh, and he, he went home to practice his soft shoe routine, Mr. Wellman. Who are you, young man? Mr. Wellman, Mr. Mullins. Uh, Mr. Mullins, Mr. Wellman. Afternoon, sir. C can I get you a chair? We're just going to try Dr. Hall. No, number. you can't get I me a chair. I mean, no, 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 thank you. I'm not staying. And neither is anyone else. I said I was going to stop this and by God. Where did you say Grogan went? Home to practice up, Mr. Wellman. He's in the show. You were so thoughtful to think of sending him over. I didn't send him over to join the show. I sent him over to stop it. The fire laws. Didn't he explain about that? Well, yes, Mr. Wellman, he did. But we have promised to comply with all the obsolete regulations that um, you were uh, dug up. This is treason. This is an outrage. When I sent Grogan over here to close up the show, he should have done it. Now I'll have to. All right, folks, get out. Pack up, go home, go away. There won't be any show. Go on now. This is the chairman of the Board of Governors speaking. Go home. I wish you'd got here sooner, sir. I couldn't quiet him down like that. <laughs> Mr. Wellman, just exactly what is your objection to this production? I think it's a degrading spectacle, undermining the dignity of this college and making a laughing stock of our institution with this, this uh, poltroonery. Uh, I, I think the word you want is buffoonery, Mr. Wellman. A <laughs> uh, poltroon is a man who raises poultry. Uh, no, no, Sidney, a poltroon's a coward. Oh, he raises cows. Oh, I guess I... <laughs> Will you please stop this nonsense? I am here to see that Ivy College is made a mock of. Uh, not made, uh, that is. I mean that, that we must not lower our standards to such a... What is it, Dr. Hall? I didn't say anything, Mr. Wellman. <laughs> oh, well, I thought you were about... But I'd like to. I understand that your principal objection to this fundraising project, the Faculty of Follies, is that it lacks dignity. Precisely. And if then, if we could inject the right note of austerity, of quiet rectitude, of elegance and restraint, you might withdraw your objections. Certainly, but, but you can't do it. How could you do it? With you, Mr. Wellman. Uh, huh? Look, sir, look. What we need in this fish fry is an MC. Who's frying fish for what? <laughs> Uh, Mr. Mullins means, Mr. Wellman, that the only thing lacking in this production is a master of ceremonies. Someone to introduce the acts with quiet dignity. Someone with a platform manner. With personality. With charm. With sparkle and wit. In short, Mr. Wellman, you. You mean just because I have achieved a certain modicum of success as a speaker that I join you? Me? Dignity, Mr. Wellman. We need it. You have it. So can we get it? <laughs> uh, this, this is certainly not what I came for. I mean, uh, what is the, 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 the purpose of this business? Oh, it's a worthy one, Mr. Wellman. We are raising money so that the undergraduate Ivy players can afford to travel and compete dramatically with other colleges. It means a great deal to the college, publicity-wise, as well as for morale. And possibly for future endowments from those who recognize the interest we take in dramatic subjects. And endowments? Yes. Uh, uh, publicity, uh, morale, yeah, I, I see. Why didn't someone tell me what... I, I, I mean, well, well, let it never be said that Clarence Wellman ever overlooked a possible endowment. Even a barely possible endowment. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, well, what does an MC do in a thing like this? Oh, well, well, an MC well, comes out and brings the axe on, on, you see. Wait, let me tell him, folks, right. please. Uh, look, Mr. Wellman. Yes, millions? <laughs> Mullins, sir. <laughs> Uh, the, the, uh, the endowments will be later, Mr. Wellman. <laughs> all, all right. All right. Well, go on. Go on, Jimmy. Uh, thank you. For this production, sir, all you have to do is stand at the side of the proscenium. That's over there. Yes, with a big, bright spotlight on you. Oh, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and introduce the act. With your natural dignity and with a touch of humor, perhaps... 
Mm, just as though you were, as though you were talking to your stockholders. Stockholders don't like humor, Dr. Hall. <laughs> they see you smiling, they, they, they think you're being tricky. <laughs> Let them see tears in your eyes, and uh, then they don't worry about watering the stock. <laughs> see, I'll, I'll try to remember that. Yes. That's, that's exactly what we mean, Mr. Wellman. Look, look, let's try this for size. We're just going to run through Dr. Hall's number. You introduce it. Of course, you'll have ample opportunity to write your own material, Mr. I don't need to write it. I think on my feet. What are you going to do? Uh, Three blind mice, as Kipling would have written it. You're on, Mr. Wellman. Uh, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, it was from the great Rudyard Kipling we learned about India. Through him, we know how the people of Calcutta dress, how the people of Bombay eat, and how the people of Burma... (laughs) Shame. (laughs) And now we will hear in the mysterious atmosphere of the East the familiar story of the three blind mice. Folks, our president, Dr. William Todd Hunter Hall, with three blind mice, as Kipling might have written it. Take it, Maestro. I mean, Maestro. This is the tale of the three blind mice. As it's known from Madras to Cornpore, from Hyderabad to Serinkapatam, from Simla to Chandaragore. (laughs) And ever they tell the tale anew as bond of our kith and kin of the three blind mice. And the sin and the price. <laughs> and the tales that they paid it in. Reckless, rampant, raging they ran, ah, for the three and blind. Hot on the track of Mohammed Din's wife, golden-skinned daughter of Ind. Wife to a farmer, a man of the hills, where the Khyber leads down to Lahore, and the slithering stride of the bitten snow slide is drowned in the bullock train's roar. Deep in the gloom of the shuddering grass, darkling the thickets amid, where the jungle old rolled fold on fold to hide the wrong she did. She who was wife to the man of the hills, with carving knife curving and keen, left three mice, and blind. Three pitiful stumps to show where their tails had been. (laughs) And this is the tale of the three blind mice. As they tell it in Mandalay, where the dawn does all sorts of impossible things. (laughs) And China's across the bay. tell the tale anew as bond of our kith and kin of the three blind mice and the sin and the price (laughs) and the tales that they paid it in. Thank you, Vicky. Oh, and Mr. Wellman, you were wonderful. Yes. Oh, yes, your introduction gave me the inspiration I needed. <laughs> Mr. Wellman, for a man to come on cold turkey and hit one into the bleachers with sock yaks like that is not only one for the book, but two for the money and three for the show. 
this clam bake is 10,000 clams ahead as of five minutes ago. Well, thank you, young man, for the compliment. Uh, I take it that was a compliment. <laughs> uh, I didn't quite understand. All... Oh, Dr. Hall. Mm-hmm. Tickets. Uh, tickets? Yes, tickets. If I'm going to uh, M the C of this show, I want some tickets. Family, friends, etc. Gee, well, what, 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 what's the matter? The tickets. There aren't any, Mr. Wellman. I, I, I'm afraid we're sold out for the entire three days. Then put it on another three days. My, my goodness, hasn't anyone around here any imagination, initiative? Well, local, let's print a lot of posters. Plash to the town, throw some handbills around. Run it two weeks if we have to. And another thing, I think if the fiddles were moved around back at the saxophones, and then uh, let's have some more amber spots here. This production of the Halls of Ivy was broadcast with an actual audience present in the studio.